thank you, Farah. What a, a very, very long introduction there for me, which sort of uh, make me a little bit humble. And um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this breakfast talk. I know it's early, but it's really great to see so many different faces. Um, today's talk, as Farah introduced, is how do we define the soul building? And to me, light is the medium. So the question I have in mind all the time is, what is light? In the realm of physics, um, light is a very confusing, but also very interesting and wonderful uh, <coughs> phenomenon that it has two different properties. It's either, it's, it's sometimes behaves like particles, and sometimes it behaves like waves. How shadow occurs is when light behaves like particles and get obstructed by light. And light are made up of with spectrums of wavelengths that when you see white light shining into prisms, it got split and diffracted into a rainbow of colors. So this is what we've learned from our physics lessons. But when light enters through eyes, magical things happen in our brain. What we have learned about light, how we see, how we admire light, is inherent to mankind. And it's very similar to the abilities that we learn to walk and learn to speak. And um, from childhood, we develop these abilities through the interactions with the world. And light has a key role to play in human development of our past and present. We see light in, um, in a very powerful way in sort of guiding us through um, how we see things around us, but also it's um, way how we perceive the world. Moods of light are very difficult to describe. In theaters, lights create the scenes of romance, excitement, suspense and fear. In movies, light is often a narrative element of a set that people use and use to convey ideas. Light often have a fair, hold a very fundamental place in ritual, health, mood, memories, and religious experience, like the consuming fire. They're lighting candlelight. There are many religions that use the language and the beauty of light to describe as a metaphor for illuminations and um, also as an eternal guiding light for divinity. The evolution of culture through light actually varies over time and geography as well. How we as people interpret light and how, what our preferences in light quality and experiences varies across culture. In the Nordic countries, the deep blue atmospheric light and the long light summer nights and the dark winters really means a lot to their people, holds a big part in their mind and their soul. Like what famous architect Louise Kahn said, we were born of light. There's a quote here um, from Louise Kahn. We were born of light. The seasons are felt through light. The only, we only know the world as it is provoked by light. And from this comes the thought that material is spent light. To me, natural light is the only light because it has mood. It provides a ground of common agreement for man. It puts us in touch with the eternal. Natural light is the only light that makes architecture architecture. In the Oriental world, the traditional lightscapes are made up of light and shadows. A Japanese novelist, Junichira um, Tanazaki, in his very inspiring book, In the Praise of Shadows, he takes his reader through what he perceives as the Japanese cultural heritage of light and shadow, and also the conflict about the use of shadows in Japanese interiors, as opposed to the modern bright and uniform light that a lot of the countries, the people, try to 
aspire to. Junichiro Tanasaki said, we find beauty not in the thing itself, but in the patterns of the shadows, the light and darkness that one thing against another creates. In the Middle East culture, the sun and the sky are seen and regarded as a divine light from heaven. Here's a quote from an Iranian architect when he did the research about light and the traditional Islamic architecture. And I'll leave you to read an extract from his quote. In the Islamic culture, light symbolizes heaven, truth, realization, even if the brightness are hidden by shade or darkness, but the light and shade itself create and make up the perceptions and the meaning of the space. Today's in the 21st century, things has changed. A lot of the, um, the, the urban nightscapes has now become a new arena where many global cities would compete for recognitions. They consider brighter lights, the illuminated skylines to become the new model of progress. This is a nighttime image of the Earth taken from outer space by NASA. You can see with the rapid globalization and growth, sadly, this balance of dark and light will literally and metaphorically shift forever. Light is the fourth dimension of architecture. It has its own atmospheres and ambiences. Light is surely the most subtle and motive means of architectural expression. Light expresses space in a language that are made up of many different characters, and I call these characters of light. The surprising light, the branded light, the meaningful light, the guiding light, the interactive light, the social light, the attractive light, the high-tech light, the green light, the beautiful light, and the functional light. A renowned Romanian sculptor, Constantin Bancuzzi, he said, art must give suddenly all at once, the shock of life, the sensation of breathing. In architecture, this sensation of life and breathing is most powerfully activated by light. Light directs movement and attention, formulates hierarchies and focal points, creates atmospheres, and manipulates sense of space. Like a piece of music, how light and shadows <laughs> articulate volumes into subspaces, and the interplay characterizes space into with the rhythm, the sense of scale, and intimacy. Just think of the joy and revitalizing energy of the morning sun, the romantic and the weary light of the evening, the cool lights of the moonlit night, and the sensational colored light of sunrise and sunset. The gray and depressing <coughs> light of the autumn and the vibrant but chilly, chilly light on the shining snow of the winter. Light as an annunciation is a fine example where a piece of architecture transform a building into a delicate instrument that plays the musical composition of light and space. This is a project um, called the Mermaki Church in Banta, designed by a Finnish architect, where you can see the sunlight piercing, the rhythmically vibrating sunlight <coughs> piercing into the interiors. As if Mozart is actually playing the directed and tuned rays of sunlight 
into the space. And when you add the color light onto it, it adds another dimension of vibrancy to this resonance of light and shadows. Daylight is our most <coughs> profound connections to nature and life. But it is like almost everything that, uh, in a relation to nature, sometimes we take it for granted, and daylight is one of them. Nowadays, we spend 90% of our time indoor, and built spaces are like visual jackets that light is only considered as afterthought. Daylight is um, considered during a planning process, but not vital mm -hmm. as the outcome. Light, to many people, still understood more as artificial light there to deploy it, and daylight being the support. Aging, urbanization, advancing technologies, climate change, energy, these will influence the way how our future is shaped. The way how we adapt our lifestyle in a rapidly changing, socially and environmentally, challenging world in the future is a difficult hurdle for architecture. But what we know remains constant is light is always the fundamental infrastructure of our social life. As what Walt Disney said, you can design and create and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it takes people to make the dream a reality. So now I'd like you to imagine, imagine a city of the future. To me, a lot of times, a scientific movie image will come to mind. Extremely tall buildings, unreachable sunlight. It's quite a miserable image of darkness, but light can change that. Light can enhance a space for us to live, work, play, and socialize. I would like to um, share with you a project called the Imagining the Low Line. It's an exhibition in New York. Um, it's a pilot project. And what we have done is trying to explore, use this project to explore a way of bringing daylight into to underground. And in this case, it's to repurpose an underground disused turnaround station. This is how it looks like. And turn it transform it into an underground park which is filled with daylight qualities that entice people to enjoy, to relax, to play, and return. What we did, what you see there, is um, there's on top, of the, on top of the ground, there's a series of heliostat mirrors and light pipes to bring light to the underground. And by using a series of lenses and reflectors. We put light reflected back on the ceiling, but some of the lights are channeled through Fresnel lens to create some artificial sunlight for this indoor environment. Light breathes light, life to buildings, and gives it character. And light is the element that connects people and place. So rather than putting light into building as afterthought, I think light should enter a new role in defining built spaces. We should consider designing building around light. I propose we put more emphasis and time at the start of the project to imagine, to explore, and discover, defining first the context, then the characters of light, and in turn the soul of building. Now, I want to... Um, share with you another example, a project that's very close to my heart, and to explain what I mean by a journey of light. This is the new Acropolis Museum that we designed with Bernard Schumi Architects. Um, back in 2001, we started on that project. And now, today, this museum is ranked the top three museums in the world. This is where we started the site. It's right in the middle of the residential Mariani district of Athens, at the bottom, at the foot of the Acropolis Hills. Like many prestigious uh, projects, new build projects, we get a project brief at the beginning, and it says something like, they want a world-class museum, international 
for the 21st century. It needs to house all its collection. It needs to be equipped with all the technical abilities, state-of-the-art <coughs> facilities for conservation. So this is a very, I would say, a very generic brief that you see in a lot of museums like that. And we wouldn't be able to make this unique place, unique museum just out of that. So what happens is, in the first meeting that me and Bernard have with um, our client, Dr. Pandemalis, in his studio office, we didn't talk about design at all. But together, we imagined, we imagined how the visitors would interpret but also interact with the three unique purpose of the building. First is the objects inside it. The second is the cityscape around it. And the third is the archaeology underneath it. In that se session, we plotted out the walk over the history. And by designing inside out, we created a journey of light where we imagined how the visitors would really meet and would like to be interpreting and interacting with each of the art artifacts and the collections. This museum is also known as the Museum of Daylight, where the changing natural lights give characters to every single space uniquely for the collections of different era. By doing so, we also think about how to make sure that we can have each of the sculptures and the art artifacts to be co-displayed, even though they are of different media, different, uh, they have different co conservation requirements, to co-display so that they can together, they can narrate a coherent story about the history. We also explored ways of um, crafting and shaping and texturizing the building, looking at modern technologies of glass, shading, combination of this, but all those within the local context of the Attican sky, something very precious to the local Greeks as well. And by using different ways, even where to position skylights, how do you com do a combination of front lighting to gray slide to bring the best <coughs> modeling effect for the sculptures? This is important because the spatial narrative is so important in reflecting the original sculptures in its glory, and also by use of light to actually bring out the original intentions of the artist, the, narr the narrative, the story behind it, despite the missing pieces. I mean, here, what I show you on this slide is um, there are two pieces of marble. One is the original one, and the other, the other one is a replicate. Only by putting them together, they can tell the full stories about the processions <coughs> in the olden days. And you can see how important it's like to bring out the differences. The one that is a replicate or the one that is less least sculpted. And having gray slides would make the difference in the modeling of those. And of course, the other, the other um, clue that you can get, which is the replicate marble, is the one that is a lot more uniform fairer color as well. Over time, sculptors use different styles and techniques to create these um, sculptures. But they are not sculptures for the sake of just being an art piece. They are all created as part of the ancient architecture. So they're designed to be outdoor. They are buildings. They used to be buildings where people go to. And today, they are displayed in the museum. But it's not just something to look at and nod it. Yes, these are some sculptures that people put in museum. There's a lot of in, there are a lot of architectural academ academic interest in these, particularly, for example, the hairstyles of the goddesses. The hairstyles are actually braided very differently for different time of the period when these sculptors or architects created these. And it is very important to strike a fine balance of natural ambient light and the intentional focal spotlight to bring these differences out and create that clearance. And at night, the museum becomes a jewel box, revealing all the marbles inside it. And more important is 
visually reuniting these marbles with the original Parthenon site on top of the Acropolis Hill. So could this building has been so beautiful and with meaning had light not been the prime considerations right at the start of the project. I'm absolutely sure that these guiding principles can be applied to many other projects, uh, airports, railway stations, retail, residential, commercial, or even urban design in a public realm. And I'd like to invite each of you today to think about the project, the building that you're designing at the moment how these principles can be applied. A Chinese philosopher once says, we pierce doors and windows to make a house and we should recognize the use alone of what is not. But there's a lot in the middle part of it that I would like to mm -hmm. sort of read out to you. We pierce doors and windows to make a house and it is not these spaces where there's nothing that the usefulness of the house depends. Therefore, just as we take advantage of what is, we should recognize the usefulness of what is not. Experiencing architecture is multi-sensory. It is not just about seeing. It is also very much about feeling as well. So what's this Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, Mens when he said nothing is devoid. And here's an image of an Islamic architecture depicting what this, how this void being crafted by light. The underlying soul, which becomes the essence of the space. And it is this space that's filled with people who <coughs> inspires feeling, experiences, and memories. And without light, form and space would have no inherent meaning at all. So I'd like to just end this with a philosophical note. And, but also, what I see is interestingly, even contemporary physicists, quantum physicists like Niels Bohr, agree to ancient philosophers that really our sense do deceive us. Thank you. So I believe it's uh, question time. If uh, anybody have any questions, I, I, a piece of research I heard a long time ago that really stuck in my mind. It was about people, people in an old people's home with dementia, and it explored the effect of, of, of exposing them to much brighter light than they'd be exposed to normally. It's something like two thousand lux, so all the lighting in the, in the home has changed, and it showed it showed a real positive response. These people responded very positively to being exposed to a much brighter light. Uh, thinking of that in, the, in contrast to what we tend to do in offices, where we tend to go to dimmer light because we're working with screens, and the, the, the tendency is to make that dimmer and, and even dimmer to save energy. So I'm just wondering what you think about the way our offices, the light in our offices contributes to our sense of health and well-being. Well, I can give another lecture about that. <laughs> light is just so complex, but it's just wonderful. Um, it does touch on the biological side a lot. And it is not just about intensity, but also is the, the color composition of the light as well. Um, I wouldn't, hopefully, when we talk about office worker, we as Arab, we don't really are uh, the dementia's patient side that we need to deal with. But there is certainly in the work environment, the workplace, there's an area about circadian um, rhythm of our body and how we can actually uh, improve the well-being by considerations when we design office space. If, for any reason, we have a space that we don't have any daylight. Of course, daylight should be the first drive or the first thing that we should bring into the office that naturally is synchronized with our body. But if we, for any reason, we have to work in this space for eight hours a day, just imagine that, and uh, we have all these artificial light to give us all the brightness that we need, this is not enough. What is important for us to synchronize with the body clock, ideally, is to be able to be in an environment that's synchronized with the diurnal cycle, which means it's warmer light, so sunrise, sunset time, and much cooler and slightly brighter light in the middle of the day. That's the ideal. And um, then one might 
ha touch on to the area of the ethical because there may be some really mean bugs to think about. Uh, the reason why we synchronize in a way of the midday being much cooler is because of our hormonal response to the bluer light. The blue light extends through our eyes, can suppress melatonin to raise, keep our alertness up. So that means more productive, which is great. But if you keep doing that for eight hours a day, what happens is you'll be so pumped up that when you really finish work, you try to go home and relax and sleep, you couldn't sleep. And sleep cycle, the sleep-wake cycle is just as important for our health and well-being. So we just need to be tuned to the right light. And naturally, if we have got daylight outside, why not? And it's very important, particularly in the winter months, is for us, lunchtime, really go out, have a walk, have a stroll, to be exposed to natural light before we come back to the office. No need to use energy to make the light seem to, to, to synchronize with the body clock. That's the idea. Um, thanks for an inspiring talk. Uh, I was wondering whether there are things that you might consider convey the soul of the building besides light. I would say sound. This is actually something that we're explore, exploring about ex experience design. Because when you think about senses, of course, vision, uh, with probably 80% of the information we, we encounter in the world will come through the eye, the vision side. But sound is just as important. I think that both of them, when they work together, really do enhance experience. And at this point, I would like to sort of invite you to our exhibition upstairs. We do have a um, concept, like concept carpet, a concept uh, experience pod that we're exploring that scenarios of how light, even without the clear graphical images of the light, how you actually sense the color, the contrast, difference, and the dynamic changes, together with the sound, give you a very, very vivid experience of where you are, what you experience around the world. And that is almost giving you the feeling of how babies, newborns, learn about all these abilities of sensing and how they interact. Through interacting with the world, they start to see what comes through their eyes as images is actually what they are seeing, and they can find meaning of it. And um, those are something that we are demonstrating upstairs. Thank you for a really sculpted and inspiring talk. Um, you're talking about museums and big public projects. But in a city, for example, like London, where there is so little space for experimentation on a daily basis in your domestic life. Uh, most of us will be renting or will be, I don't know, living in spaces where there's very little space for, for this kind of experimentation. How do you deal there with light? I think it also will rewind back of um, how I learned about this awareness of light. It is a lot about observing. Um, that's when we really have a lot more time rather than just spending all our time on iPad and computer and so on. But as you look at nature, how the light works, how the light changes, how shadows are cast. And at home, of course, um, with, the day, with the daylight, it is about use of different kind of domestic shading, blinds, to get the right mood in space. But also with the advance of technology nowadays, with LEDs everywhere, you go to IKEA, it's got all these shelves of light is making it so much more accessible light to people. And also because it's so accessible, people want to find out more. They'll be asking more questions and doing a lot more trying out of the light and color, how that reacts with some of the even interior finishes that one has selected, which might look perfect in daylight conditions, but at night time, how does it work together? and whether it should work the same way or it needs to be completely different. I think there is a lot more, I think there's a lot more sort of connections now that if we want to do it, there is a lot more opportunities to try things out. But it is really going back to the basic, the two, the first few slides. There's a basic physics about the light and shadows, how we can really work with it, but also the potential of the colors and how the colors can be split by scientific is prison, but even other kind of glass will create those kind of magical moments of splitting white light into colors. Thinking about most of our modern cities where the value of developable space is so high, uh, I was struck by your coming about stations and interchanges and new metros and whatever, almost all underground. If on the surface, a 
developer can tell you the, the value of, the, uh, of airlines. How do you counteract that when you want you are talking about natural lights uh, and quite emotional and, su and subjective things? How do you win against the person who can tell you the price? It's a very good question. I I come from Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is for tall, high-rise buildings. But I also know that from developers' point of view, they like sales as well. Um, when you have a daylight space, when people come in and feel that sort of wow experience and environment, they naturally want that space more than the others. So, so I can understand why tall buildings is important. You have created more of the upper space as well. But even the public realm, it's important to have public realm between all these tall buildings so that it's a opportunity for daylight coming to that space, not just about the residents enjoying that ground, but also a potential of punching holes, but in artistic way to bring light further into any other <coughs> underground um, infrastructures. And in Hong Kong, it's very, very common that we build <coughs> high rise over a podium, which is on top of a lot of some metro stations, etc. And those are opportunities. Sometimes the awareness of daylight rather than daylight as a replacement for electric lighting used for energy, because it doesn't work in that sense. But it's that sense of daylight make a big difference of people feeling that connection and feeling the space being valued. And it's the value where one can attach to it. But so the soul is still about how to create that wow when you actually don't have the kind of real lux from the daylight. By thinking about the journey of people could be moving to a much darker space coming from the street level. And then it's a contrast that you create that atmosphere when daylight do exist, not as a sort of substantial way, but it's the essence of daylight in that space. I think the importance of talks like this, um, they really help reset your core design principles because everybody knows light should be one of the fundamental things that you design a building around. However, it's not until you, you sometimes reset your own uh, ethos uh, that you can say, actually, let's reevaluate every single design brief we have, no matter what stage of the project you're at, whether it's small residential and the introduction of a skylight, just to allow a, a, an element of the sky to be seen throughout the day, interacting with, with the seasons, or larger projects where actually you know, we, we can reevaluate at each stage in the design process. Rather than just looking at gross internal areas or circulation flow or anything like that, the fundamental natural principle of light in a space really enables the, the users of the buildings, the clients, the developers, the owners to, to get something almost for free that's magical and special. You know, light is, light is unbelievably helpful. Uh, I thought Florence's talk was uh, really inspirational. Uh, I really liked it very much. Um, I, I always, uh, in the projects that I do as an architect and as a designer, uh, I, I very much use daylight. Uh, I try to use daylight anyway. And I think the projects that Florence has worked on uh, with all her team uh, and, and so on have been wonderful. Um, and I think it's very inspirational that the uh, lighting is also used in other parts, like for example the project that she showed uh, of bringing light into the underground, which is something that we, we don't do very often. And I think that project was very interesting. We really liked it. So my work at London Sustainability Exchange leads me to talk about people. So I was so engaged with how Florence was talking about the relationship of how we use our spaces. Um, the bit that I was quite excited by was the question and answers at the end when people were saying, well, actually, developers don't want this. Because when our work with sustainability, we're often asking developers to what they think is making compromises. And 90% of the time we're not. But um, so we were talking, say, to Westfield about retail space and how people don't actually want, retailers don't want us to look at our product in a real open daylight. They want to be able to create the light so that we see their garment in the best way that they want. So I was just interested in the needs of the um, client as opposed to just the user. And um, whilst we started to talk about that, it's, it's about the spaces that we don't think are more exciting than the ones that, um, that we've actually created. So I thought that too was very exciting and interesting. Yes, it was a very interesting uh, and inspiring talk this morning. Um, uh, I used to work as a, as a lighting designer in my early years, so it was nice to revisit some of those thoughts and ideas um, 
that that one thinks about as a as a lighting professional. Uh, I work for Lenlease and we are currently redeveloping Elephant and Castle. So we're trying to bring new life to a part of London uh, that was uh, in need of regeneration. So I think those lighting design principles in and around those areas have, have maybe already been discussed <laughs> in that development at the moment, but they're certainly, I think, on the radar of what we're trying to do in the spaces in Elephant and Castle and in some of the public realms and public spaces in between the buildings, bringing lots of natural daylight in. And although I'm not the designer myself, although the architects have looked to those things, it certainly reminds me of some of the things that they're trying to do and trying to design into the buildings there to make the spaces as good as they can be.